All right, good evening, everybody. It's uh, Mike Buckham here. I'm sitting with my guest, Dom Rollinson. Good evening, Dom. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. So um, we've started exactly 7.30, um, and we've got um, quite a lot of competition for airtime this evening. I believe our president is speaking at 8 o'clock, um, but he probably will only start at 9 o'clock, so hopefully we'll be finished by the time he starts. Um, and hopefully you get some very relevant and, and current information from this webinar. Um, so it's been a, a bit of a hiatus for, for Dave and I. Um, we started with a bang in lockdown, um, but I think there was a bit of a saturation of webinar content and we, we wanted to make sure that we brought everybody something that was, was worth watching instead of just uh, throwing stuff out there. So we hope it's been worth the wait. Um, we really wanted to do, I've, I've always wanted to do something on pelagic birding. Dom, you're, you're a super keen pelagic birder and I'm sure you're excited to talk to us about some albatrosses this evening. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, so it's been a, um, yeah, using words, yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be, it should be a fun, fun hour and a half or hour. Um, All right, let's get, awesome. let's get kicked off. So talking about Dom, um, we, we uh, have prepared a few slides. That was when he was probably about 12 years old. <laughs> um, and uh, Dom had to identify the species for me. Dom, what's the bird you're holding? So that's a great shearwater. That's from Nightingale Island in the South Atlantic. Right, and um, Dom's just going to quickly talk to us about his, his PhD. He's a doctor. Um, he, he got his PhD at the Fitz, um, and he, he did his, his PhD on seabird bycatch in the longline fisheries. Yeah, so my title was uh, Understanding and Mitigating uh, Seabird Bycatch from a Pelagic Longline Fishery. So pelagic longline fishing is, so it's different to trawling, so a lot of people get them mixed up. So trawling is when you've got those big nets behind the um, or behind the trawler, and they're going for deep water hake. So they're setting their nets really, really deep, bringing it up. And those are the vessels that we look for when we go out on our um, pledge trips off Cape Town. But uh, on, my, on the boats that I was working on, it's, um, it's baited hooks, and they really are long lines. So they set, when I was out at sea, we were setting between 120, 130 kilometers a day of uh, baited hooks, uh, a baited hook every 50 meters. And basically, as the as the hooks are set, that's when the birds are, get caught. So they see a baited hook, well, they see the, the sardine or the anchovy, and they, they go, they swallow the, swallow the bait and basically get hooked in their stomach or in their neck and die quite a, probably all well, drowned basically. So quite, probably quite an agonizing death. So I was looking at uh, basically understanding the data from the last eight or so years, I think it was 20, 2007, 2014, and looking at ways of basically reducing that seabird bycatch. So yeah, it meant a lot of time out on the ships, which was, which was tough, but also a great way to increase your subregion list. I'll never forget Dom um, getting into signal um, coming into Cape Town Harbour, and the first thing he did is he, I think he contacted all his mates and just yeah. made sure that we were all still alive. Yeah. So a lot of time spent at sea, Dom. Yeah, um, and uh, I mean it was great in terms of I got a lot of useful data, but uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of lonely days out there. It was Jenny, just me, who spoke English. So I was out on the Japanese and Korean boats. Um, but uh, yeah, I did enjoy the time out there. And then just very briefly, so my PhD, is, as I mentioned, looked at, looked, looked at the data set for over that eight year period. Also did, looked at uh, seabird diving studies. So looked at white and petrels, how deep they were diving. Um, as well as uh, looking at uh, tracking studies. So where the white and petrels, which represent around 70% of our bycatch, where they get, where they forage, and, and what overlap they have with the fisheries, and I did a bunch of at sea trials, um, looking at weighting of the of the hooks and covering the hooks, and different ways of reducing the seabed bycatch. So that was it in a in a nutshell. Great. I'm um, sorry. I, what I forgot to do when we started was to introduce Dave. Um, Dave is is uh, working the buttons in the back. So if you have any questions, um, you can stick them in the chat room. Um, so I didn't do a Zoom 101 either. Um, the, the, the Zoom is very simple. You've got a taskbar. Um, look for the, the button that says chat and just type your chat in. I've, I've muted all participants. Um, just makes it a little bit simpler and a bit cleaner. Um, but if you do have questions, just stick them in the chat room. I'm going to unmute Dave um, so that he can, um, he can answer questions as we go. If you just give me a second so I can unmute him. Uh, Dave, you should be unmuted now. Can you say hello to everybody so we know you're a real person? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mike. 
Looking forward to the, the chat this evening. Great. All right, so um, moving on um, from Dom's uh, PhD, he, he, he's a, a very able guide for birding ecotours and, and fully employed by them, and he does a lot of the, um, a lot of the tour organizing, so um, plays a vital role there. Um, he's got a sub-region list of 875. I kind of threw that number down, Dom. Is that still right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. That was a very good, efficient guess of mine. Yeah. And this was um, obviously a picture taken in the Mediterranean. <laughs> it looks very flat. No, that was, that was in Mozambique, actually, where it was very flat. Oh, okay. Like a duck pond. Right, and, um, and it looks like you've lost about 20 kilograms while on the yeah. boat. Um, 11 kilograms. All right, so you spent many days, as you mentioned, and, and my first interaction with Dom was a very memorable one. I didn't actually meet him, but um, I heard his name because he and his brother Pat and uh, a good friend of theirs, Andre, yep. um, discovered the, the, the most twitchable golden pipits of the subregion, I think, this far. There's been a few others. Yeah, there's this a one was, in Cusie that's stood around for a while. That's right. Yeah. But this is the one I twitched with, with my, my father and my, um, my son. And so um, Dom um, created some very fond memories for me as well. And then I think um, what we wanted to do this evening, just before we talk about albatrosses, is, is really talk about... Um, the new Sassel 5 launch. And the reason we want to talk about that is Dom is one of the co-authors. So you'll, you'll see his name on, on the list of authors. Um, and we thought we'd, we'd just talk a little bit about the, the Sassel that's going to be launched. Um, Dom, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your involvement in the project? Yeah, so I came on board quite late into the project, probably only in, I think it was June last year. Um, yeah, so it did mean, I guess, my work was maybe a little bit more condensed. Um, but uh, it's it's been it's been really great being involved in, in the whole project. Um, it's been a lot of work, but um, yeah, you know, I've I've really enjoyed it, and it's been a great learning process. Um, and we actually I was chatting to to the guys at Strake today, and is actually being bounded I think tomorrow. Um, to find it. Um, yeah, so it has been printed and it should be coming out in, in early July. And uh, yeah, it'll be. In three different versions, so we've the standard English, the Afrikaans version, and there'll also be a larger, a larger guide. And yeah, they're going for 370, and then I think it's 450 rand for the larger one. For the larger edition, yeah. All right, let's just look at some of the the new features. Um, obviously, quite a lot of new illustrations from from two new artists. Um, let's start with Fancy. Yeah, so Fancy's done. So he he did we did all the night jars. Uh, so, I mean, a particularly difficult group of birds, incredibly tough to identify. And we, we didn't feel that our the previous artwork from Sasso 4 had given these nachos or done, done these nachos justice. And Francis has got involved and done some really amazing, uh, amazingly detailed illustrations, uh, which has certainly improved things. And he's redone all the seabirds. I think that's about 70 species of seabirds, something like that. And we'll be using those illustrations in this yeah. um, talk tonight, and you'll see that they're incredible. Yeah, so I mean, maybe just to, to, to highlight that now, we, we got special permission from Strake to use Fancy's um, seabird illustrations in this, in this webinar. So I think it's going to provide us with a great balance between photographs and, and illustrations, yeah. and, and Fancy's um, seabird uh, drawings are, are incredibly good and I, I did uh, chat to one of your colleagues uh, Neil Perrins and yeah. he had chatted to Fancy and Fancy regretted um, doing all the seabirds because they're actually far more than he originally thought they were so yeah. a lot of species to deal with and then maybe talk about um, um, some yeah. of the other artists. Yeah so Alan Harris is the other new art, uh, artist we've got on board so Alan has done all the all the raptors for us so another big uh, tricky group to identify and uh, yeah, so I particularly enjoy his vulture plates and his um, the falcons. Yeah, I think this falcon plates is is really really amazing, and um, yeah, really lifelike. Uh, so Alan did all of those for us, and he did a few other plates um, additionally. And then Norman Arlett. So him and uh, Peter Heyman did the previous artwork for the previous four other editions of Cecil, and this is just an example of a. Of one of his plates, of these bush rocks. It didn't turn out incredibly. Yeah, well, the, the resolution. resolution on the webinar is maybe a bit iffy, but in the actual yeah, I mean, it's, printed it's, book, it's, it's really be sharp. Yeah. The maps on on Sabap data. Yeah, so it's been a lot of time on the maps. So we've redone just about all of the maps to some degree, um, 
And I chose this, this spread here to show the, actually to show the Franklin. So there's, there's a few new Franklin splits based on very, very, um, very recent uh, research. So we've got um, Stallman's being split from Cokie Franklin and Kirk's being split from Crested and also not on this, on this spread, but uh, Canadian Franklin from Correct. Orange River Franklin. So this just shows the, the, the new maps. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little tricky to draw the maps, especially for Stallman's because there's very little data on where the divide actually, where the, where the divide is for these two. And, and then, yeah, a lot of new, so I spent a lot of time going through Trevor Hardacre's rare bird reports and basically updating all the vagrant records. So that was, that was actually quite fun. And as you can see, there's very recent vagrants here, white throated beta from Port Alfred and red rum swallow from the Eastern Highlands. Of yeah, Norway. I mean, that was specifically why I chose um, those two particular species is because we, we know that they're two, two very recent um, rarity records and they've, they've both been included in, yeah. in, the, in the new print. And uh, I, I think this just shows um, the, the, the level of detail in the, in the text now, it's been highly expanded. Yeah, I mean, we spent particularly spent a lot of time on the, the difficult groups, so raptors, night jars, we, we beefed up the text a lot, a lot for these um, compared to Sassel 4. So you'll notice um, that difference in Sassel 5. And then, yeah, a bunch of new uh, additions to the, to the list. So uh, Tahiti Petra of Durban, short-tailed shearwater off the Cape of Gullis. That was the white wagtail around the corner here and white tern, that was Etienne's bird from Eastern Cape. Correct. So all these new sub-region additions have been added. There's probably about, I mean, I'd imagine 15 of them, or something like that from the from Sassel 4 to Sassel 5. And if I can uh, just um, highlight that you were responsible for the short-tailed shearwater. Yeah, so that was, off, um, yeah, that was off Cape Agullis. On one of your, on one of your observations. Yeah, on one of the long line trips. Um, it's still with the Rarities Committee. Um, <laughs> But, uh, don't don't say that. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. It's but, in the book. Yeah. But uh, it should be hopefully go for you soon, I hope. And yeah, um, another another big selling point of the of um Cecil 5 is the addition of these barcodes. So you might have noticed there are barcodes under the maps uh, for, for all the species. And um there's basically there's a free app which you can download. Um and the details will be in the book, or they are here actually. And um you can then read from your phone, you can read the barcode and it will play the call. So it's, I think it's quite a nice way to learn your bird calls. You can page through the book and at the same time, you know, use your, use your phone and play the, play the call, um, which will, I think that'll work quite well. Yeah. And then there's also the revised app. So yeah, it's been, we've been working on that in the last month or two, uh, particularly. And yeah, it's got an entirely well, very different uh, layout compared to the previous app. Um, and obviously all the artwork that's in the field guide has come through. Yeah, everything to everything from the book has been included in the app. Uh, and a, a feature I particularly jo enjoy is the, if you look at the, you see a little play button on the taxonomic and on the alphabetic list. So you don't actually have to go into the bird pages. You can just you know, scroll through the list and play it through there. And I used it out the other day out birding and it's a really quick way of accessing the course. So maybe just to clarify, the app's not available yet. Um, no, it'll come out, it should be out at the same time as the book, so early July. Yeah. We're expecting the book around about the 9th of July. I think that's the official Yeah, I think so, it's somewhere around there. Right. Um, and we've got a lot of new, new calls and um, we've got uh, multiple calls for yeah. the different species. So not just the song, but we've also got aggression calls and alarm calls and various other noises that they make. Um, and quite a nifty feature, I think, of the new app is that you can you can actually zoom into the illustrations and uh, we've scanned just about all the old artwork too. So the, the quality is much better than, than before. So you can zoom right into these images, you know, just use your two fingers to zoom in and the same with the photographs. So um, I, I quite enjoy that a, feature, yeah. Not looking at a small image on a, on a phone, you, you can, yeah. you can, yeah, you can zoom right it. into the door of that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Tested there, so the name's at the top. Yeah. You can see it's a lot oh, better, yeah. Um, <laughs> And then another thing to note is that we will be regularly updating it. So we'll be getting, you know, so what you see now is not what it'll look like in six months time. We're gonna regularly, you know, be looking for new new bird calls all the time, same with photographs. And um, new records, new rarity records. New, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. So we will be updating it as often as possible. Right, okay, so um, there's um, not only the reason to 
to hear us talk about albatrosses, but you've all come on to this webinar to perhaps win a prize. So we've got a, um, a, a kindly donated copy of um, the Sassol fifth revision um, as a giveaway. Um, and all you've got to do is you've got to identify pelagic species on the photo that's going to follow. So the rule is uh, quite simple. There are several, photo, uh, several birds in the image. In fact, there are six birds in the image. There are five different species. So you will see there's a duplicate species. Um, and the first person to give all five species correct in no particular order um, will win the book. And we'll announce it at the end. Dave is on the buttons in the background. So just, um, I suggest you do two things. One is you key in Dave's um, cell phone number so you can WhatsApp him yeah. the, the answer. Um, and the other thing you do is we, we'll leave this, the, the photo um, out there for a few seconds, but maybe take a little quick photo of it. So while we're talking, you can, you can try and identify. There, there are potentially some key pointers that we're gonna talk about tonight that might help you. So it's a great photograph that Dom took um, on one of his um, pelagic trips. Um, there's, um, uh, it, and that's the thing about pelagic birding is you see tons of birds um, in, in just such great numbers. So is everyone ready for the image? There is your image. Um, there are five different bird species in this photograph. Um, and we would like you, they're not all albatrosses. I think that's the first clue. Okay. And the second clue is that there are, there are two birds that are the same species. And I won't necessarily tell you which ones those are. Okay, so let's just Mike, just while we, Mike, just while we're looking at the image, um, someone's asked how, how they can reduce um, people's videos um, on the screen. So I can just quickly talk to that. Yes, thanks, if Dave. You, if, you, um, if you look at the top, uh, I think it's the top left-hand side of, of those videos, there's a few options there which allow you to actually reduce those, um, those screens. If you, if, you, if you click the one on the left-hand side, it's just a little dash or a line. That will then reduce all of those videos to nothing. Great, thank you, you Dave. Start with those settings. Cool. All right, so you've all had a chance to um, suss out those birds. Um, I did not get them all right, um, and uh, so you should be challenged. It's a tough one, but uh, let's see how we go. All right, so let's talk about um, pelagic uh, birding. So, so Dom, let's let's try rattle through this quite quickly so we can get onto the real yeah. meat of it. Um, there, there are many operators in South Africa. We're not here to punt any particular one over the other. Yeah. Um, they all head out generally from either Hart Bay or from, from um, uh, Simonstown. And, and then obviously they're Durban Pelagics and they're Pelagics that go occasionally from St. Francis Bay. Um, you'll pay around 2,000 Rand, um, depending on, on the, the cost of fuel, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's weather and swell dependent. Um, the Pelagic trips uh, are often canceled uh, or postponed um, because um, the safety is, is obviously key and, and the conditions need to be good to enjoy the birding. And uh, conditions change quickly. So layered clothing um, and stability on these boats is variable. So sometimes the boats are quite stable and sometimes yeah. they're not so stable. And so seasickness is real and is very unpleasant. And um, I'm, a, I'm a terrible sufferer from seasickness. I think I've got a little concoction that works and we're not dispensing medical advice in this webinar mm -hmm. because we will get sued. Um, try and speak to someone who knows, but there are different methodologies. So this is a great picture. Thanks to, to John Graham who gave it to us. I was actually on this pelagic. These two people, uh, the, the lady in the foreground is a lady by the name of Ruth Miller. And the guy with the blue glove is a guy by the name of Alan Davies. And in, I think it was about eight years ago, they were doing a global big year. They were the first people to really target a, a huge global list. And they ultimately ended up with four and a half thousand species and a pelagic was put together where they were put on the pelagic and a couple of people managed to get on as other guests. And I was one of those. And um, it was important for both of them to see the specific species. So you can see Ruth is not great, but she <laughs> wasn't nearly as bad as Alan. Alan was really bad and she's, he's, supporting him. she's kind of supporting him. This was, I think, on the trip back to the harbour, but he was mostly sitting in the corner um, and, and vomiting every 30 seconds. And I'll never forget, um, a wandering albatross um, was sighted. And for them, it was obviously an, an incredibly important bird. It's one of the world's top birds and to not see a wandering albatross in a big year would be not good. And uh, everyone's shouting wandering albatross and Alan did not move. And Ruth actually went over and physically lifted his head in the direction of the wandering albatross and shouted at him, Alan, wandering albatross, look at it. 
and he looked at it and he said, I see it. And then he vomited and then they were happy because they both had seen it and they could take it. So yeah, it really is the worst when you do head out. I mean, they, I get it occasionally and they've said, you know, I've heard people comparing it. You just want to fall off and die. And I did. I remember looking <laughs> overboard and thinking, I just want to fall yeah. off and end it all. Well, they say there's two stages. The one is that you think you're going to die. And the next stage is that you actually hope you do yeah. die. Right. So if you're going to go out to sea, uh, make sure you, you take precautions. Um, you generally return at seven and re return at three. Um, you're looking for trawlers. You go past Cape Point um, when, when you're talking about the, the Simonstown ones, which are probably the most um, uh, prevalent pelagics that go out. Uh, you're looking for trawlers because that's where the birds are. Um, you can see this photo of, of Cliff Dorse, who's one of the top um, pelagic guides in yeah. the country. And, and the other person is my son, Adam. Um, this was a pelagic we did last year. And you can see that raft of birds behind um, a trawler. And I've got a quick video, which I hope actually works. All right, so that's, um, that's a trawler. This is one of the long line trawlers. Um, and um, I hope the video is playing, but it's just to give you all some idea um, of what a pelagic trip out there is like. If you haven't been, you might be amazed at, at the volume of, of birds that are flying around. Yeah, and you'll also be amazed by, I mean, the diversity behind there. So you can sit behind there for an hour, you know, waiting for the nets to come up and, and you know, sifting through all those, the birds in, in the flock. And you think you've gone through everything, and next thing, a, a massive wandering albatross flies through, which you hadn't seen before. Yeah. So there's there's a continual in and out of birds, a revolving of birds yeah, in and yeah. out of the, the stream, and yeah, so and it's just worth sticking there and waiting it out. Yeah, I mean, there literally are thousands of birds, and and just in this 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 frame, you can see now there probably are um, twelve or thirteen um, species of birds. Obviously, yeah. gulls and a few gannets, but um, some some really cool tube noses as yeah. well. All right, so. Um, You'll, you'll not see, it's not like going on the Zarkel Drift Road and ticking 150 species in the morning. You're going to see about 20 species on a pelagic trip. Yeah. Uh, but what you see is, is fantastic. And generally, you're going to get um, great views of great birds, provided you're not vomiting off the back. Yeah. Um, and then time of year is important. Tom, maybe just, you want to tell us about time of year? Yeah, so in terms of diversity, you probably get a um, higher species count in summer because you've still got a few of the winter birds, which often will stay over into summer. And then you've got, of course, the Northern Hemisphere species, which push down. Give us a, a couple of those Northern Hemisphere species. So like yeah. Corey's Shearwater, you get Sabine's Skull is another one. Yeah. Um, red Knot, a, a Red uh, Phalarope. Yeah, Red Phalarope. Yeah. Is, 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 is a real a special, rarity, yeah. real special. Yeah. Arctic Terns. Yeah, and then, I mean, in winter, you get the bigger numbers. So what's happening is it's obviously free, you know, much colder down south. So all the birds are pushing off their breeding islands and, and force uh, further north. To, to feed, I guess. Yeah, to feed yeah. and to escape the cold yeah. and, and the frozen waters. So in winter, you get the really big numbers of birds. You get 5,000 birds behind a, a trawler or something like that. Yeah, so this this um, video that I showed, that was um, a July pelagic, and it was yeah. a classic July pelagic with huge, huge numbers of birds. Yeah, and probably a better chance of getting your albatrosses, your sort of the rarer albatrosses, like the gray-headed right. and solvent and that sort of thing from about July to October. All right, um, so... Um, most pelagic trips that we know of are, are one-day affairs, um, although BirdLife South Africa has put together some amazing multi-day pelagic trips. Um, so this photo on the right was taken at um, Flock 2017. So um, there might be some listeners um, at the moment that are trying to frantically pick out um, whether they're in this photo, and I'm sure there are a few. I think Dave's in that photo, and he might even be picking his nose. Um, but yeah, so that Flock 2017 was a massive success. Yeah, I mean, um, that first morning just... Yeah. Set the time for rest of the trip. I'll never forget, um, we, we were late for breakfast, but it was still pitch black outside, and we rushed to breakfast, came back to our room to get our camera and binoculars, and I opened the curtain of our room, and a wandering albatross 10 meters away floated past our balcony. Yeah. It was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, that's probably some of the best, you know, couple of hours of sub-region birding we've had. Yeah, we had, had gray sooty petrol, sooty albatross, light-mantled albatross. Yeah. White-headed petrels, wandering, wandering albatrosses. Yeah, it was amazing. amazing yeah. Lots of life is for everyone. And, and so there were a lot of highlights on that trip. And, and I, I have to say that there was one particular low light. <laughs> yes. Um, this was, we were told there was a theme for, for the, the one gala dinner. And the theme was you had to dress as a penguin. What most people thought that meant is just wear a bow tie. But myself and my two sons thought uh, it meant a little bit more than that. So that's the three of us um, going to dinner on the gala evening dressed as king penguins. Um, so what we didn't want to do tonight is, is necessarily give you too much information about Flock 2021. I think a lot of people who are listening 
are, are thinking this is in preparation for Flock 2021. Um, we hope this resource is going to be useful when that does happen. Um, we, we don't necessarily know. Um, it all depends on MSC, and I think BirdLife are working very hard to, to get it going. Um, what I have been told is that it will definitely go. It's just a case of, of when it goes. They may need to postpone it. So hopefully we'll all meet um, on Flock uh, to Marion, um, hopefully in 2021, and um, we'll be able to circulate these webinars again yeah. for some key pointers. All right, so before we kick into the albatrosses, I thought it would be useful um, to, to highlight where the Southern Ocean breeding islands are, because that's where all these birds generally breed. So, so Dom, maybe you want to take us through a couple of those islands that are key? Yeah, so, excuse me, so starting in the in the west, so South Georgia um, has huge, uh, huge populations of, uh, of seabirds. So not just uh, your albatross, but also penguins, penguins. massive king penguin uh, colonies down there. But like most of our uh, black browed and wandering albatrosses come from South Georgia. We've then got the Tristan, the Cunha and Goth archipelago. And that's where our Tristan albatrosses come from and the Atlantic yellow-nosed. And then moving further is that east. Uh, so to the Prince Edward Island, so that's where the flock 2021 is, is going to be going. Uh, and that's South African owned. And then we've got the Crozet and Kerguelen, which are French owned overseas territories, which I think Amsterdam is also French owned. Okay. Um, so that's where the Amsterdam albatross come from. And again, more, so huge numbers of birds in the Crozet and, and Kerguelen archipelagos. And then heading across to all the New Zealand groups. So these are, you know, Chatham, Antipodes, you can see them there. But that's where a lot of our, like our shy albatrosses come yeah. from, and bullers. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll get onto those, but I think it was, it was useful. It, it was useful for me as well, because I've never really known exactly where all these islands are. And I think it's important in, in knowing where some of these species come from and where some of the splits are. So, yeah. for example, Atlantic and Indian yellow-nosed albatrosses, they breed on different islands and they look very similar, but they, they breed totally different, yeah. different places. All right, so um, John, we've done all the intros and I think we're now getting onto the real stuff. Um, so um, I just um, pulled out this quote, which uh, makes a reference to the bad luck of an albatross. So I might enjoy being an albatross, being able to glide for days and daydream for hundreds of miles along the thermals, and then being able to hang like an affliction around some people's necks. So quite a cynical fellow, Seamus Heaney. Um, he's obviously, obviously Irish. So, I mean, that's obviously got its root in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, yeah. and that was a, a poem written in, in the late 1800s. And uh, essentially, um, it was about seafarers who, who uh, came across an albatross, and the captain ended up, I, I might be wrong in some of the finer details, but the captain ended up killing an albatross. And the crewman said that was very bad luck to kill an albatross. And they then entered into the doldrums, and they had no, no wind to take them anywhere. And they all sort of suffered yeah. from from lack of water and food, and they they made him hang the albatross around his neck as punishment for for killing it. So, the expression um, like an albatross around your neck comes from that. But albatrosses are on one of the world's top top groups of birds. Yeah, Would you not you agree? maybe think about doing that for the, the fishing vessels, which catch, yes, the, catch the cats, the albatrosses hanging. Hang um, but yeah, amazing birds, and it's something every. Birders should really try to at some point get out to sea on the pelagic, and you are sitting off Cape Town behind the trawler with you know ten thousand seabirds around you, half of those being albatross. It's a really incredible experience. It is, um, and yeah, hopefully this. Uh, All right, so people excited. So what we've done is we've we've put together um, slides on each of the species, and we've we've um, ordered them in sort of their groups, um, but but we, we've ordered them as an introduction in their groups. And then we've, we've ordered them, when we talk about them uh, species by species, really in, in terms of how, how common they are, and we'll, we'll end up with, with the most uh, rarely seen one. Yeah. Um, but you, you get the great albatrosses, which are the diamedia, which are the whitebacks. Yeah, so these are the, basically it's the, the wandering group. So wandering albatross used to just be a single species, and it's been split up into generally into five accepted species, so the wandering or snowy albatross, Amsterdam, Tristan, Gibson's, and Antipodean. And we've got three of the wanderer types which occur here, uh, and all very, very difficult to distinguish. Correct. And you can do royal and, and, and wanderers fairly easily, 
but within the wandering group, it, it's a very, very tough challenge, which we'll highlight today. Okay, and then that, that's, that word on the right is a, is a southern royal, um, and we'll talk about how we, we come to that decision. Um, and then there's the Shire complex, where we, we, we'll talk about Shire, Sullivans, and, and Chatham. Chatham yep. or Chatham, whichever uh, pronunciation. And what I've done is is um, just highlight the the status of each of these. So if it's a if it's a high number in red, it means it's really rare. And if it's a, a green number one, it means it's uh, regularly encountered, and you've got a good chance of seeing it out at sea. So um, shires are, are, are probably our most common. Yeah, that's in black road, Yeah. Um, but you you're going to do well to see a Sullivan or a, or a Chatham. Yeah. And then uh, the other molly mork. So molly mork is an expression given to the small albatrosses. Yeah, yeah generally for the Thalassarchi albatrosses, which is the genus of the of these bullers and grey-headed and chaff and, and uh, shy albatross. Um, generally used for these southern ocean birds. So, you, I mean, you could call, in theory, call a, a laysan albatross a, a molly mork. A molly mork, but it's generally kept for the Thalassarchi uh, genus, which is in the southern ocean. Right, and and um, once again. Um, the bird on the right is is um, an Atlantic yellow-nosed albatross, yep. and just a, a, maybe a quick moment to thank all the contributors um, for the photographs. So, so this is one of Trevor's picks. Um, so, thanks to all the photographers, we've credited them where necessary because I certainly haven't photographed all these birds. And then this is probably my favourite little group of, of albatross species. Yeah. Um, they really are. They're very special to see in the subregion, but also they are spectacularly beautiful. Yeah, these sort of very elegant looking birds. So that long pointed tail, long thin, thin wings, and almost looking you know, pterodactyl-ish yeah. out at sea, um, particularly the light mantled. So um, yeah, a really great group to see. And we got to see two of these on, on one day. Mm -hmm. on Flux 2017. Yeah. Now. And then the very last one, um, and you can see I've rated that 11, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that particular record as we get to it. All right, so let's, Let's start off, and, and um, what I've done is um, just, uh, well, in fact, that was not right for me to say. What, what Dom has helped us with is, is to categorize these team things. Effort. A team effort. Um, we, we just given some information there, so you can always go back and look at the information. We, we feel it's, it's useful to tell you how many of these birds are, are in existence. Where do they breed? And, and what you can see in the map at the bottom, those two little red dots are, are where shy albatrosses breed. Um, Tasmania, Auckland, Antipodes Islands. What is its conservation status? What is our status if you had to go on a pelagic trip in the SA? Yeah. Um, how do you see it? When do you see it? And, and how big is it? And, and what can you confuse it with? So yeah. we've got the same template for all the species along with some wonderful plates from Fancy um, and some photographs highlighting some of the features. Yeah, right. So let's kick off with Shy, which is probably a bird that you can see even from land in a, in a nice yeah, big northwester uh, yep. um, in good conditions. Yeah, we saw them. I did some sea watching a couple of days ago and had them off Camps Bay. Yeah, in big numbers after that uh, cold weather which came through over the weekend. All right, so let's just um, um, talk about the the key features with with shy albatross, Tom. Yeah. Okay. So for shy albatross, you're looking for. I mean, at a distance, it looks like an entirely white underwing, but it's actually got this very very thin black border around the edge, and even the white is going into the primaries there. So. Basically, when you head out to sea, especially off Cape Point, you've got four of your, the four common albatrosses, which are shy, black browed, and the two yellow nosed. Um, so, I guess starting off with this, for the first start of this talk, we'll, we'll talk about the, how you differentiate those four species yeah. from each other. And then, if it's something different from that, then you start worrying about the, the rarer species. Yeah, and the real, the real finer details. Yeah. Course. So, it's that, that very, very thin black border. Also, there's that black thumbprint you can see um, close there on the shoulder, which we've highlighted. And you know, these are illustrations from the, from the new Sassel, which have these useful annotations, uh, which highlight the, the key features of each species. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Don, one of the things I, I've noticed being on pelagic trips and seeing a lot of shy albatrosses, you get, you get quite a lot of variation in, in the grayness on the head. So some shars are, are very grey on the head and some are, are much paler. So. Yeah, so like most most of the albatrosses, they start off dark okay. and they lighten with age. So you can see this juvenile here um, has got a very dark hood and, and, and collar. A color, yeah. And then it's getting lighter uh, as, it, as it ages. So that immature bird is paler and they get even paler as adults. So this is an older bird? Yeah, that's it's an immature. immature. And then these adult birds these are quite gray looking birds there but they, they can be quite pale um, 
you know, gray cheeks. Yeah, so here's, here's a, a photograph showing those features. Um, you see the, the black thumbprint is very obvious and the very white underwings yep. um, and the very thin black border. And, and as you say, this bird a, is, a, is a, an immature because it's got that grayish border. Yeah, it's now immature, yellow. yeah. With that dark it's tip. It's a dark tip and it hasn't turned into a yellow tip. Yep. All right, and here's another pic of the, the upper wings of a juvenile. And then here's a, a nice full adult shy albatross with the, the tip of the bill is yeah. has now yellowed. Um, so that, that would get even even more yellow as uh, as it gets older. You can see it's got a slight dark tip to the bill there. I think we've got a pick later on in comparison with Sullivan's where yes, we've got yes. a very yellow tipped um, bill. Yeah. Dom, talk to us about uh, stead eye and quarter, um, those two subspecies and where they breed. Yeah, so these are the two subspecies of shy albatross. Um, so stead eye is known as white capped albatross by some authorities and then adult so quarter is known as a, as a shy albatross um, and the quarter subspecies uh, breeds on Tasmania okay. or offshore islands there and we probably of the birds that we get off South Africa around 95 percent of our birds are stead eye from, or white capped albatross from from the New Zealand islands, New Zealand islands. yeah and uh, that's from looking at genetic studies from DNA studies from um, from birds caught out at sea on the on the long liners, so that's from a few hundred birds. All right, so moving on to our, our second most regularly encountered, um, possibly tied first most yeah, regularly probably. encountered. Um, so black bright albatross, it's it, it breeds in, in numerous places um, on these these islands. So that's um, that's um, South Georgia, and then obviously uh, Prince Edward, um, Crozet, um, and then some of the New Zealand islands as well. So. Uh, a very widespread bird breeding in, in a lot of different places. I think maybe just we don't have it here because it's never been recorded, but Campbell albatross breeds on Campbell Island and yeah. is very similar except for a pale eye. Yeah, so if you see a black bird albatross off here you get with, a, with a pale iris, you can get very excited. It's the first for the subregion. Yeah, so it's basically identical with a, with a pale iris. Yeah, that's what you're looking so for. So, what about what are our features? What are our features for a, for a so yeah, con contrast this with the shy albatross, which had that almost entirely white underwing, and you're looking here for that really broad black border. Um, so the birds, the juveniles, start off with almost an entirely black underwing, which then lightens with age. If you look at our immature in the bottom left corner there, and then go to an adult, that black border gets thinner and thinner, but still at an adult is a really thick black black border. Um, you're also looking at the the orange bill with the reddish tip. As an adult, that's a very distinctive feature, and you can see it you know, very, very clearly here. Um, and then juveniles start off very similar bill and um, bill coloration to a shy, to a juvenile a shy. shy with that grayish bill with that dark tip. And a lot of the the young albatrosses show that that same sort of feature with the dark tip to the gray bill. Right, I think we've got some nice pics of, of, of the younger birds. Uh, he has a classic adult. This is just the upper parts. You can see, obviously, the very yellow bill and the, the dark orange tip. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there you see the, the dark, the, the very wide border, which is very different to, to what we saw with the shy albatross. Yeah. And, yeah. the, and the name black brow is, it, it really does have that very distinctive black eyebrow, mm. although most, many albatrosses do have that anyway. Yeah, and, and uh, that black brow can, uh, can vary massively between individuals. It's quite interesting to have a look at, you know, when, when you're out at sea and seeing the point blank range, just how different that black brow shape and extent can be. All right. Um, so here's um, a couple of juveniles, and, and you can see how it's quite easy to to confuse it with the shy. Maybe um, tell us how you'd, is it, is it really the border um, on the underwings? Yeah, especially, so like this bird on the left here, the upper wing, you could be forgiven for mistaking it for a shy. It's got a very, very similar similar bill patterning, the gray bill, the dark tip, and also the amount of gray is variable. You know, it's got more of a collar there than, than the gray hood. Um, but that's an, another variable feature, so that can be tricky, but you look at size and the general shape of the bird while out at sea. But then if it, you know, if it banks and you can see that the underwing, it, it's been clear as day that this is a black bird because it's got a mostly dark underwing. Um, there's a few headshots, so nothing too complicated with the with the black brow. Um, no. Here's a here's a slightly closer one. So it really is a, a very beautiful bird, and and uh, got those amazing features with the black brow. Yeah, and just becomes the bill becomes more orange with age. So you can see from grey to the sort of browny colour of immature to be bright orange on adult. Yeah. 
Okay, now moving on to the, the two yellow-nosed, um, and we spoke about the breeding islands. So Indian yellow-nosed obviously breeds in the Indian Ocean. So that's um, uh, Prince Edward, Marion, um, Crozet, Kogalen, and Amsterdam Islands. So yep. those are all Indian Ocean Islands, and hence the name. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's um, I, I've, I've got a little um, trick because I forget these things quite easily. But when I think of uh, Indian, um, I, I think of the eye in Indian and white head. Um, and then with um, Atlantic, and I know it's the American spelling of gray, okay. I think of A and gray. Um, so Atlantic and gray. So yeah, um, we'll, we'll come to, to the, the features here, maybe talk about um, Indian. Yeah, so the, if you're looking at the underwing patterning, it's basically intermediate between the, the shy albatross and the black brow. So it's not as thick a border as a black brow, the black border, and it's not as thin as, the, um, as a shy albatross. Uh, so, yeah, it's very much intermediate. It's actually the yellow nose of the smallest of those three, yes. of the um, shy black yeah, I was going to say, size is quite a feature because when you see yellow nose, they tend to be a lot smaller. Yeah, shy is a big mollymore. Yeah, it is. One of the bigger yeah. Mollymorks, so these are quite delicate birds and a lot more agile yeah. in flight. And so you, you, can, you notice that fairly easily out at sea. Um, and it's got this entirely black bill um, as, as a juvenile, but at a distance okay. that, that appears all black. But it's actually got that yellow, yellow ridge and the, the reddish tip. But uh, looking out for, you know, while, while you're out at sea, maybe just looking for an ore dark bill. Yeah. Superficially, it appears as an ore dark bill. That's actually very noticeable. Even when we, we looked at the, the shy and black brides bills, they're, they're pale with a dark tip, whereas yeah. this is, a, is an entirely black bill. And even when they're young, it's very yeah. beautiful. And then, I mean, it, it can be tricky. It's not, it's not as clear cut differentiating between Atlantic and Indian. Um, so, I mean, Indian does have a white head. But they can show these gray cheeks, yeah. um, and then Atlantic can be very, very pale at times. So it's not just a simple. You see some very obvious Atlantics and very obvious Indians, but yeah. then you get the, the ones in between. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the useful feature is the shape of the eye. I mean, I know we'll come we'll come to the head shot as well. So yeah. there's the, a nice shot of the underwing. So it's not as broad as black broad and not as um, narrow as as shy. Yeah. Somewhere in between, and that very dark bull um, with a, with quite a white head and. And we'll talk about the eye. Um, yeah. So, so the eye. Maybe just talk about the eye. So I think it shows it better in the in slide the, in the coming slide, up. Yeah. Um, but basically, you're looking at the, the shape of the eye patch, the dark eye patch. So it's quite rounded in Indian yellow nose, as you can see in this um, the photograph. And then, if you compare that to the next species coming up, which is Atlantic yellow nose, it's more of a triangular shaped eye patch. And that black eye patch normally extends further forward towards the bill. Um, not not quite reaching the bill, but it's, it is more extensive in, in that respect. Um, and then the other feature is obviously the, the the yellow the yellow stripe on the bill. Yes, if you yeah. can get that close, which you do often get that close to see that that yellow stripe on the bill. Yeah, so that's a good feature. So it's it's more pencil shaped. It's it's quite pointed. We're talking about yeah, that, that that Mike is highlighting here. So it's the basically the the, the top of that yellow yellow ridge. ridge. So that's very sharply pointed in an Indian. And as you'll see in Atlantic coming up next, it's more rounded. Okay, so here we're moving on to, to Atlantic and, and let's just highlight that it, it reads Tristan de Cunha and um, Gough. Uh, Gough Island. Um, so definitely an Atlantic breeder. Yep. And, and you can see even in this image um, of Trevor's, you can see it's a much more noticeable gray head. And then you can see the, the shape of the eye patch is more triangular. It does look more triangular yeah. in that image. Yep, and it can be it can be quite variable uh, that that uh, eye patch shape, but it's it's probably most important when you're looking at the the juveniles, which uh, both have entirely dark bills. They haven't developed the yellow ridge yet, so you can't look at that, and they probably haven't developed the the um, the head patterning, so the grey hood. Yeah. Um, wouldn't be developed yet. But I think uh, so many of these yellow nose albatross, the juveniles and the mature birds, go. Uh, unseparated between yep. the Atlantic and Yeah, and similar Indian. to giant petrels, you don't get good, look, good enough looks. So if I'm on a pelagic trip and I see a juvenile yellow-nosed albatross, I can actually tick both species? You can, yeah. Okay, great. Or whichever one you need. All right. So, yeah. Oh, of course. That's yeah, another yeah. way to do it. Yep. Okay, so um, here's a nice image showing the, the underwing pattern, very similar to, obviously, Indian. Yeah, it's very, very similar. I'm not sure there's any difference between the two. Uh, so that's not a feature to go on, but 
in this particular individual, quite an obvious gray hood. Yeah. And uh, not just the gray cheeks of the Indian. Um, yeah, so you wouldn't, if you saw a bird like this out of sea, you shouldn't at all identifying that. And, and this one. I mean, that, that eye is very obvious, even at a distance like yeah. this. You can see it takes up so much more of the, 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 the front of yeah. the eye. And something I've used, and I'm not sure how accurate it is, but I, what I often do is I look at the, the, the color of that, the rump or the, the lower back there, which is really white. And I compare that to the color of the head. So in Indian, yeah. it should be very, very similar. But here you can see there's a very strong contrast between the two. Yeah, that's a very good uh, And that point. actually often works out. Um, it might be a useful feature to try to use out at sea. And then this is the shape of the, um, that yellow ridge we were talking about. So much broader here, much, much more rounded on the, the top of the, or the base of the Almost yellow. instead of a pencil, more like a cokey. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and then um, yeah, I mean, this image doesn't show the the, the, the front-on shot, but you can see the the triangular shape of the the eye patch, which which yeah, is and it's obvious. actually really extensive in that individual, almost reaching the bill. Yeah, the, the black eye patch. Right. All right. So now moving on to um, the bigger birds. Um, yeah. And we, as I said, we're going through sort of the regularity of seeing these species. So we've we've done the four common ones, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I think you should feel like you, you you would want to see all four of those species on a winter trip off, off, uh, off the Cape. Um, Cape, yeah. off the Cape. Um, but as soon as you see a whiteback, you know you've you've um, had a very good pelagic. So, yeah, that's what you get excited about. So I mean, wandering albatross, the bird with the largest wingspan in the world, yeah. um, 20,000 remaining um, and under great threat with, um, with the mice on, on Marion Island. Um, lots of different breeding islands, um, so very widespread, but I think most of the breeding pop population is actually on Marion Island. I think uh, up to 50% of the yeah. world's breeding population is on Marion. And, uh, and also a lot down in South Georgia. On oh, South uh, Georgia. Albatross so here's, yeah. here's South Georgia over here. Yeah. And we're going to talk about Tristan as well. So this um, snowy albatross, this is um, the, the, the classic wandering, um, breeds on these islands and then Tristan breeds on Tristan de Cunha and Gough Island over here, or Inaccessible Island, which is part yeah. of that archipelago. Right, so... Um, Wanderer, um, I mean, they, they take so long to mature that there's, there's such uh, variation. Even, even very young birds are, are quite impressive birds out at sea. Yeah, they are. Um, so they basically they start off really dark, as with most albatrosses. And Can I just go to the next slide? Because it shows um, two nice um, younger birds at, at different stages of, yeah. of plumage. So this would be a, a classic juvenile on the left here, entirely dark upper wing um, or upper parts. And then the body, which you can't see there, would be all dark brown, a chocolate brown. And then that bird on the right would be an immature bird. It's, uh, you can see it's getting that leopard face spotting on the back there. Uh, it's basically the white is slowly starting to come through. And they do take, I mean, they can be in this immature type plumage till they, I don't know, 12 years old or something. Okay. Um, so they take a really long time to mature. And that's, if we go back to this image here, so that's a, that's a really old bird. Um, so that could be on a 20, 30 year old bird at, at that stage. They do get even whiter than that. So basically just the tips of the wings are, um, are dark. Um, but yeah, I mean, also the tail there has, has whitened almost entirely, I yeah, think. Which is unusual. I mean, you, you generally see wanderers have got a bit of black in there. Yeah. Um, and then another <laughs> useful feature to look for in the wandering type albatrosses is, is that pink uh, neck mark which none of the royal albatross get. Um, We've got a few, you can't see the pink box really so well in, in there, these. But, um, but these are just two birds of different ages and you can see quite a lot of black in the tail of these birds. Um, and then um, that's, that I think shows this, this pink mark over here and, and really this monstrous pink bill. Um, yeah, a really heavy old. bill and, and really big head too. Yeah. Big, almost squarish head. But when you compare that to a royal albatross, it's a much slimmer, sleeker head yeah. with a longer bill which we'll, we'll talk more about the, the differentiation between the Wanderers and the Royals. Probably the Royals come up next. Um, and I think we've got Tristan up next. Yeah, so we, we um, I'm just going to, before you start talking, yeah. I'm just going to say we are definitely sidestepping the Tristan Wandering Albatross discussion from Flock 2017. Yeah, we are. You're not going to be talking about that at all. No. Um, we, what, what we will say is that, uh, we, we said at the beginning, Tristan and wandering were part of the same species until about 2004 when they were split. 
um, and now they have been split. Um, but in, in all honesty, from our perspective, we don't really know um, how to separate these things at sea. Yeah, basically until something actually comes out in, in the paper, um, we don't know how to differentiate them. I mean, generally, Tristan's are generally a bit darker. Um, they take longer to, to whiten than the snowy albatross, or the wandering albatross. Uh, they're, they're a little bit smaller, uh, so you can tell them apart on, um, on the measurements. Yeah, so if you've got the birds, um, you don't really have them in the hands because they're too big for that. Yeah. But if you've got them close by where you can measure them with a the tape measure, you might have a better chance. Yeah, then you should be fine. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, it's very, very tricky uh, slash impossible at the moment. Is it right to say that if you're at Tristan de Cunha on a boat um, uh, sort of anchored off of Tristan de Cunha, the chances of seeing a wanderer are, are, are less likely or, or almost nil, or is that not also? Yeah, I mean, probably say? close to nil, but uh, wanderers do wander big distances, yep. and there's every chance that wanderer pops by, but uh, based on probabilities, it's it's going to be a Tristan, really. So I think after Flock 2017, 2017, there are some people that have ticked Tristan, and there are quite a lot of people that haven't. I, yeah. I personally have not ticked Tristan albatross. So I, I think what what uh, I know this may sound flippant, but um, the yellow leg band on the foot of the bird where they've been ringed um, on Tristan de Cunha is, is a good way to tell them apart. Yeah. Um, but Dom now tells me a little bit earlier before we came online that they're starting to ring wanderers in South Georgia. With yellow bands. Yeah, we, we heard a few years ago that they'd, they'd been using these yellow leg bands for um, some of the birds in South Georgia. So then it's no longer just as easy as looking for a yellow leg band. You've now probably got to be able to read that alphanumeric code and then uh, see if, you know, link it back to the database and see if that bird was actually rung on Tristan Acuna. So basically on plumage, we don't know how to tell these things apart. So this is a bit of a cheat. To, uh, to look for the yellow leg band, but there probably isn't another way to right. tell them. So, so if you've got a good enough camera to take a photograph of the leg band with the numerics and <laughs> alphas, you can maybe um, tick it with, with some degree of certainty. And then we just threw these, um, these distribution, these are, these are movement maps of, of Tristan albatrosses. Um, yeah. is, is, this based on, is this based on geolocators or? It is, yeah, it's geolo geolocated data. So that, re that records um, light levels and from that, from that can work out sunset, sunrise. So we've got the, 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 the 12 months of the year and, and how these birds move from, from their breeding islands um, throughout, um, throughout the, the Southern Ocean. Yeah, so I think so this is a paper from, so this is taken from Tim Reed's paper, I believe, on Tristan Albertshaw's movements. And I think it's non-breeding birds. We'll probably have to check that. But basically, the take home here is that from about April to October, we have Tristan albatrosses in our waters, mostly off the west coast and off the Cape of Gullis. Um, so, I mean, there's every chance that the wonders that we're seeing off Cape Point is a Tristan albatross. Yeah. Maybe even a greater probability that it's a, a Tristan That's over true. a wanderer. Um, we do get wonders coming up from Marion and from South Georgia. But um, as I say, we don't know how to tell them apart. Plumage. But there's, you know, on probabilities, they are in our waters, yeah. so we probably are. So we can tick them in. That's, yep. all I, we'll that's all I really wanted to hear. Yeah. All right, so um, now the, the, the two royals, and these are both um, New Zealand breeding birds. Yep. Um, and maybe just if you can tell us, so, so the southern royal, and uh, you can see uh, breeds um, on islands south of South Island. Yep. Um, and Campbell, then, and Auckland. Campbell and Auckland, and then the Northern Royal breeds on, on South Island itself. Yeah. And then I think on Chatham Island, as far as I can remember. Okay. So, um, yeah, Dom, maybe just uh, to help us with separating the Royals from, from the Wandering Complex. What yeah. are the key features there? Yeah, so let's deal with that for now. Uh, so you are basically looking for a few things, but a big, a very useful pointer is the, the tail. So... Royals show much more white in the tail. They show almost no black in the tail. Some of the young birds, like this immature bird in the top left, um, in, the in the illustration, that's showing a few dark tips to the feathers. Yeah, so yeah, th this one, this photograph, I and that you can see too, a yeah. little bit of black feathering. Yeah, so this is a, yeah, that's a youngish bird. Um, and then that whitens with age. But if, you, if you're looking at a, at a wandering type of a similar age here, with that amount of dark in the upper wing, um, there would be much more black in the tail. So that's a, that's a really useful feature. Um, 
Wanderers generally whiten their, their wings, so that as they get older, their, their wings whiten. They generally, it appears that as, as if they whiten from the, from the middle out, okay. so from the middle forward and from the middle backwards, whereas Southern Royals, you can see it's got this white um, leading edge to the wing. So they, they generally seem to, at least it appears, to, to whiten from the, from the front backwards, which eventually forms this almost triangular shaped wedge in the front of the wing. So really old uh, wanderers is the, the uh, identification challenge you've got with royals, where they might have very little white in the tail too, uh, but they generally they would show even more white in the upper wings. So even going into the secondaries, that's a wanderer, whereas the royals generally... It, it Still generally, retain a lot of black in the secondaries. Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the black in the secondaries over here. Yeah. And so it's, it's making that white um, yeah. triangular wedge. And then maybe the, the cutting edge of the bull, because I think that's quite a, a key feature as well. Yeah, so um, you can see I'm going to come back to the, the carpal patch in a second, but maybe just to, to, to show this, this cutting edge. Obviously, when the, the bull of the bird is open, you can't see the cutting edge. Yep. But here you can see the cutting edge over here. And, and that's, that's a key feature, differentiating royals from, from a wonder type. Yeah, if you can see that cutting edge, and it's a mostly white um, great albatross, you know it's one of the royals. Um, the uh, wanderers don't show that, uh, but it, it can often be hidden by, depending on the light, the distance of the bird, uh, often shade can, can play a role too. But if you can see a clear, that clear black cutting edge, you know you've got a royal. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back to this carpal patch, um, and then we can peg it here. This, this is the carpal patch that we, we're speaking about. So this is a, a shot of, of a southern royal. So under parts, it's actually the same bird as, as we saw in, in, in that photo. Um, but let's just peg that for, for when we get to, to Northern Royal, because that's quite a key identification yeah. feature. Um, and then another thing we mentioned earlier was that pink patch on, on the wandering on type of albatross. So royals never show that. Um, so if you, if you can see that pink patch on the side of the neck, you know it's, it's, it's not a royal. Time. Yeah. So that's a very really useful feature too. And just much as I mentioned earlier, much slimmer looking head um, and, and bill. And it's got more of this pinky yellow um, tones to the bill rather than that deep, deep, pink. deep pink. Yeah, so that's, and with, with um, experience, you can pick out um, royals and wanderers like fairly easily. Uh, they've got more of a humpback also, the royal yes. albatrosses compared to a wanderer. All right, so here's, here's Northern Royal. Um, and as we mentioned, Northern Royal breeds on, on, on Chatham and actually on um, the South Island of New Zealand. Um, Quite near Christchurch, I think. We've actually been, uh, my wife and I spent some time there. So, um, very nice to see these birds breeding on the mainland. Yeah. Um, so, separating now northern from, from southern, yeah. from the upper parts. Yeah, so we've got it down to royal. And then you need to look at, so it's basically the upper part. So, this is a nice, fairly classic adult. It's got an almost entirely jet black upper wings with that white back. So Southern Royals would be showing, at this age, would be showing, um, or they always Quite show that, of, that uh, white, whitening. Yep, on the leading edge particularly. And then as they get older, that, that Is it fair back. to say, because I mean, we, we look at this bird, it's got a completely white tail, so this is a fairly mature bird. Yeah, it is. There might be tips to the tail there, which are black. Is, is it sure. fair to say that a, that a Northern Royal is a lot easier to separate from the Wanderer types than, than is a Southern? Yes, I think so. Yeah, because of the way the white, the, 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 the wings don't whiten like they do in the southern. Yeah, so if we, there was a wonder of you know with that amount of black in the upper wing, it would be showing almost entirely black, black tail. tail. Okay. But at this, you can see with this bird, it's got an entirely white tail, so there it's a fairly clear difference. And we can even see the cutting edge on on the bull, and there's yep. no pink on the neck. So we've, yep. we've eliminated quite a few things, and then maybe just looking at the the size of the carpal patch. So if you see only get to see the bird from from below, um, that that carpal patch is much much more extensive than than it is for southern. Yeah, it is, and it's it is a, a pretty good feature out at sea. Um, yeah, I spend a lot of time on the in an area where we're getting royals every day, and you you could eventually just have a look at the underwing and, and tell them quite easy. Yeah. Um, and then you can see the cutting edge is very distinctive yeah. on this one and, and no pink on the, bill, or on the neck. Yep. All right, and then now we're getting back to some of the smaller albatrosses and um, we, we're starting with, with the next in the, in the line of, of rarity value. Um, this one's um, now started to become a, a 
pretty rare bird. I think the yeah. two royals are considered to be rare, rare species and they, they, they justify their inclusion in, in Trevor's reports. Um, but grey-headed turtle does. Although um, one was spotted um, off, off the coast of Amarnus by Peter Fester yeah. um, a few days ago, uh, which is quite, quite out, uh, uh, otherworldly, I think is the only way to put it. Yeah, that. I mean, I can't think of many or any other land-based grey-headed albatross records from, from the sub-region. Um, you know, they're mostly, almost all of our records are from off of Cape Point, yeah. heading out to sea and to the trawler grounds, and eventually a bird will come in. And interestingly, almost all of our records are of uh, young birds, so juvenile and immature birds. Yeah. So actually getting a, a, a nice adult grey-headed like this bird here is, is, is very rare, yeah. Yeah, so you can see it's, it's quite a widespread bird. It, it uh, breeds in quite a, a number of different islands. And, and I think the, the first thing that you'd need to, I mean, if you look at that superficially, now we've spoken about Atlantic yellownose, yep. you'd superficially be thinking that way. And, and the clear dis differentiator here is, is obviously the, the yellow um, bull, uh, bull base. Yeah, uh, so two stripes, so two yellow stripes. Yep. So one above, one on top, one on below. And you can also look at the underwing. So gray headeds will show very similar to black browed in the amount of the more um, extensive black. Underwing. Yes, yeah. So that really thick black border, which is thicker than a, than a yellow than nose. Atlantic yellow yep. nose. And um, maybe um, just to say, uh, remember the details of this bull. We'll we'll have a look at the headshot as well. Um, that's unfortunately a front on shot, um, but that was for, for reasons to show the the, the top of the the ridge. But um, the, the yellow stripes on top and, and below the bull are, are quite narrow. And we'll, we'll look at Buller's albatross, which is yes. one of the really rare ones. And we'll, we'll have a look at the yeah. extension, extensive yellow on that. And then if you just look at the, so here's a close up of the heads. So most of our birds are the juven, juveniles and immatures, mostly juvenile birds. So that's like the bird that Peter saw of the Orthanonis the other yeah. day. Um, yeah, it looked very similar to, to this bird over here. Yes, it did, yeah. And th this, juvenile image here shows it quite nicely. So you can see this bird has the, the white cheek that yes. often stands out against the gray hood and collar on a, on a um, gray, gray headed albatross. And it's got the all dark bill. So probably the closest thing you, you're gonna mistake this juvenile gray headed for is a black brow, a juvenile black brow okay. albatross, rather than the, um, one of the yellow, yellow nose. nose, yeah. Okay. But um, it's got an entirely dark, or maybe very, very dark gray black bill. Uh, whereas black powder have a paler bill with a dark tip. Dark tip. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a really good feature to tell them apart. All right, let's move on to, to Sullivan's. And Sullivan's one of the shy complex. Um, and uh, you can see the, the breeding islands are, are um, Crozet I and then some of the, the New Zealand islands. Um, I, I personally haven't seen a, a Sullivan's. Maybe just to, to say it, it, it's extremely similar to, to yeah, shy. It's, um, it's really, really tough. But, but to particularly the, the, the quarter, I would say. Uh, Subspecies with a gray head. Yes, it would be, yeah. Um, um, so um, we'll get to the, so this is the, the key key feature, this golden yellow ridge to, to the upper mandible. And I think it's most relevant to go to the slide, which shows the comparison between Sullivan's and, and shy in terms of what that, that bull looks like. So let me just remove those red stripes. Yeah, so, so now if, if you've got a classic adult, such as this bird in the top left here, it, it would show that, that golden brown ridge, uh, which is, and the rest of the bill also has that golden tone, those golden tones to it, and they always retain that dark tip to the bill. Um, whereas shies, as I get um, older as an adult, particularly the quarter uh, subspecies or the, the Tasmanian subspecies, the, the bills get much yellower, and they do get sometimes get a yellowish ridge yeah, to the bill. See, there's a bit of yellow on, on this illustration. Yeah, it's sort of coming through there. I think Francis done it very nicely there. And, um, but doesn't have that entirely golden brown ridge, yeah. such as Sullivan's. Um, I mean, if we go back to I just the, want to go back to that original photo because it yeah. shows that, that golden yellow ridge very nicely. Yeah, so when you've got a, a nice adult bird like this, or very close to an adult bird, it, it's, not, it's not too difficult. Yeah. But it's when you've got the juvenile birds um, such as that one over there. Yeah, there you go. The, the right hand image there. The juvenile birds are really tough to t tell apart. So shy albatross can show this really dark gray hood also. Um, and uh, then you've got to look at the underwing. 
So if, if you remember the shy albatross images from earlier on, they had this the white primaries. So there's a lot of, a lot of white going into the primaries there. Whereas in solvents, you're looking at a much, um, much the primary underwing is much darker, much darker. In, into the primaries. Um, but it's, it can it's, be so it's, difficult. It's, I mean, you can see even this bird has got um, a bit of whitening in those primaries. Yeah. So we really are talking um, at the upper range of um, highly technical identification out at sea. Yeah. Um, I mean, the juveniles might even be are probably impossible to tell at sea. Um, because there's so much overlap in the amount of white or dark in the, in the primaries. So you're really hoping for a, a nice classic adult, yeah. or at least an older immature. So this was the, the, the shy that I spoke about earlier with the very nice yellow tip, and you can see that's all gray top of the top of the bill, and where you have the solvents here, it's got this golden, golden yellow. Yeah. And this is a, a great shot that, that Trevor allowed us to use, and that shows um, a shy albatross over here and uh, a solvent over here. So obviously it's solvent slightly gray ahead, um, but the real feature is that uh, top ridge of the bull. And I'm not actually sure what the identity of that piece of, <laughs> of sea life is actually. <laughs> Who knows what it is? It doesn't look very pleasant, but they seem to be fighting over it. Um, all right, and now we're moving to, this is the bird I most want to see in our, yeah, so our sub region waters. And I'm, I'm even happy to go to New Zealand to see this because yeah. this is probably the most attractive albatross there is. And I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about its uh, identification because it's pretty easy. It breeds, As an adult, yeah. It breeds, <laughs> it breeds on, on, on Chatham Island. And um, I mean, it really is. It's also part of the shy complex. complex yeah. Um, but it has that um, banana yellow bill, um, particularly as an adult. But you can see that as a, as a juvenile, it does have a slightly, uh, slightly less obvious um, yellow bill. Yeah. So it starts off more horn colored. As a, as a juvenile, and then lightens or, or yellows, I guess, with, with age. And it, it's a really strong contrast between that yellow bill and the, the dark the gray, gray hood. Yeah. So it really does stand out. So they say, I've never seen one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm also hoping for one of those to pitch up, pitch up one day off, off the Cape. But and, uh, and you yeah, can really see these very dark red. primaries as well, which I guess is a, a decent feature. Although once you see that yellow bill, you probably- Yeah, I mean, very you know, similar patterning to a solvent with those dark primaries. Um, you know, less so than a shy albatross, but it really, as an adult, it's fairly unmistakable. It's when you get juveniles, such as this. This bird on the left, yeah. 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 Um, but really just uh, the most spectacular looking albatross um, out there, I think. Well, I, I think there's a, there's a strong argument for many of the species, but it, it really is a, a beautiful bird with that gray head and, and that beautiful yep. yellow bill. Okay, so we spoke about bullers, um, and I, I asked everyone to, to concentrate on the extent of the yellow on the bull of a gray-headed albatross. Yep. The bullers shows the same feature. It's got yellow on top and, and yellow on, on the bottom of the bull. Um, but you'll see on a side shot, bullers is, is far more extensive on, on top and bottom. Yeah. And you can see this is a, a classic New Zealand bird. And thanks to, to Rich Everett, who allowed us to use his photos. And, and these are photos that are, are in the Sassel Guide as well. Yeah. And this is a, you can see this is a number nine in the rarity scale. Yes. So I think there's only been about what, seven or eight records seven, ever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're at that stage now. These are really, <laughs> yeah. really tough birds. So if, you, if you've lost concentration by now and you can't keep up with all these features, it's probably not too much of a problem because you'll, you'll, you'll have the, the, the guide standing next to you having a heart attack when one <laughs> yes. of these pictures up. It's really a beautiful, uh, beautiful, broad yellow stripes on, on the up and yeah. Upper and the lower part of the bull. And that contrastingly pale crown. So if you have a look at that, that gray head with that pale crown, um, we actually get two subspecies of um, Buller's albatross, which is often split. Um, they often call it a Pacific albatross, okay. which uh, breeds a little bit further the east. Which means into the Pacific. Yeah, yeah, into the Pacific. Uh, but we seem to mostly get the Buller's subspecies from New Zealand. As few as those might be, so you can yeah. see, and, and that yellow is very extensive compared to to grey headed. Yeah, it's really broad base. broad base, and there you can see that's quite a nice shot of the crown. Yeah. So that very pale crown, which contrasts with the grey cheeks and, and hood. All right, so now we we we're moving into to the the really tough ones. We've got uh, sooty albatross, which we've we've lumped the two. Um, uh, Fabetria albatrosses together. Um, Sooty is not nearly as rare as Buller's, but it still is a pretty special bird. Yeah. Um, so I think most people have this on their subregion list as a result of uh, 2017 flock. Yeah. Um, but it's quite an extensive uh, breeding um, 
uh, number of islands. And, and I think the, the Fabitrias are, are very long-winged birds, very elegant and long-winged, and you said a bit pterodactyl-like, I guess, yeah. quite angular. Yeah, they are, and you know, beautiful to watch in flight, and really graceful birds. Um, and I think it's that long tail, which that shape is really distinctive out yeah. at sea. Um, you could potentially mistake it for a giant petrel, yeah. you know, an all dark or mostly dark, dark gray, brown, uh, large seabird. But it's just that shape, you know, um, giant petrels, a much chunky appearance, but really big. More head. humpbacked as well. Yeah, and pale bill. So they shouldn't really be confused. Um, and then, I mean, the, the big identification challenge here, which can be tricky with some individuals, yeah. is light mantle, which we'll show next. Uh, but basically, you're looking for, and that previous image showed it nicely, across the back, there's very little or almost no contrast between the back and the, and the, the wings. Color, yeah or the back of the wings mostly. Okay. Um, whereas if you look at, and maybe this one shows it even better on the right, you can see it's almost exactly the same color across the back and wings, yeah, it's uniform. Whereas if you look at uh, light mantle, which we'll show next, there's a very strong contrast between that pale mantle and the dark wings. Um, right, and then, and then separating, when you see them really close up, um, the, 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 the eye ring and the, the, the stripe on the bull is, is key. Yeah, so mostly the bill. The iron can be a little, a little hard to pick up. Yeah, it's and quite variable. But generally, cities compared to light mantle show a much uh, broader or more complete iron. Yeah. Um, and then you're looking at the spill stripe. So it's more of a creamy yellow bill stripe, um, which stands out against that black bill. Whereas on a light mantle, which we'll show next, it's more of a bluey gray stripe. Um, okay, so so this this is um, this is a a really, really top bird in, in, in the sub-region. Yep. And I think there were very few people who had this on their list until that, that um, amazing morning on flock. Yep. And I've probably annoyed a lot of people who are listening to this webinar who weren't on that flock, but um, it was probably the most frantic 15 minutes of birding of my life when um, someone called on the loud hailer, maybe not frantically enough, that there was a light mantle of albatross on, on the starboard side. Yeah. And I was... <laughs> I think I was unfortunately on the port side and um, knocked a whole lot of old people over in the passage um, getting to the, the starboard side and, and saw Pete Ryan running at me in the wrong direction. Um, he was going in the right direction. I was running in the wrong direction. But ultimately, all's well that ended well. We managed to get a view of it. Um, but there were a few people who were still enjoying their breakfast by the time um, they got out and saw that the bird had long gone. So it, it was one of those moments that was uh, either very good or very bad, depending on which yeah. side of the fence you were on. So, I mean, you, we spoke about very similar superficially to, to Sooty. Well, yep. in fact, in so many ways, long slender wings and that long pointed tail. Um, but that real contrast between the upper wings and, and, the, and the back of the bird. Yeah, and the tail mantle. And it's a slightly stockier bird. It's, it is a More bull headed, bird. I guess. Yes, and, and this image here on the right, the photograph shows it quite nicely. Um, you know, less of a neck yes. than, a, than a sooty albatross sort of goes from the back straight into the head. Um, and this, so does this photograph here. It shows yeah, so that too. A, and it's a slightly younger bird over there. Yeah, it's a bit more blotchy in the juveniles and immatures, as you can see on the back. And there. the young sooties, I know we had a lot of, uh, those who missed the, the, the one light mantles, there were yeah. quite a few young sooties yeah. that, that also had a bit, a bit of a paler sort of mantle um, and caused quite a bit of excitement until we all realized that they were actually just sooties. Yeah, I think mantles. I called a sooty as, <laughs> as a light, as mantle, a light mantle, mantle. We, we all do that <laughs> every now and again. Um, and then obviously we spoke about that, um, that blue-gray um, bull stripe which is which is very different to the yellow yeah. stripe on the on the, the sooty and less it's not not a great feature but less of a complete eye, um pale eye ring it's more of a crescent there um, and actually it's something i was reading recently you can look at the the position of the eye it's sort of more central if you compare that to a sooty albatross the eye sits much higher in the head and it has this more rounded shape to to the head of a light mantle with the eye sitting sort of smack bang in the middle all right, so let's let's move on to. We won't spend too much time on these last two, but yeah. um, uh, this is this is a, almost a holy grail. Um, uh, this is uh, Trevor's shot from 2013, I think he said July 2013, and um, the, this is a bird that there's. It was one of the splits from the the, the, the Wanderer complex, yep. and it only breeds on on Amsterdam Island, which has actually got quite a high latitude compared to a lot of the other yeah. breeding um, uh, Wanderer types. Um, and they believe there's only uh, um, around 100 of them 
left. Um, yeah, so I think it's only around 40 pairs which breed each year, if that, on a good year. Um, but the, the, the numbers have actually stayed fairly um, stable. stable, I guess, over the last uh, couple of decades. At around 100 birds, it seems to sometimes go up to about 150. And that's probably what that island can support. Right? Yeah, it probably had a few more before people arrived, but yeah. it is a, would have had low numbers traditionally. All right, so you, you're generally looking at uh, an albatross that, that looks like a, a young wanderer in, in many ways, but it does, it does tend to have this, this pale collar. Yep. Um, and well, it's got a, a pale mantle um, and upper neck, and it's got this um, a dark collar. Um, but in many ways, it looks a lot like um, those, those juveniles, uh, juvenile um, wanderers. Um, I, yeah. I, I guess the, the white belly, whereas a, a young wanderer will still be chocolate brown on the, on the belly. Or is that quite it's, variable depending on It's age? extremely variable. So plumage probably isn't a feature. These birds do remain much darker, and they're often shown as chocolate brown cap. Uh, throughout, throughout their life, um, and they would they would never get as white as a, as far as we know, never get as white as a snowy or a wanderer, which um, you know the upper wings are almost entirely white. They probably would never reach that that stage. Um, but the important feature of these um, wanderer types is the the black cutting edge. So it's okay. only to the upper mandible, whereas the royals have it on both um, the upper and the lower mandible, and they often show this. Um, a dusky tip to the bill, which is probably a good feature. And you can see that on the, particularly on this image here. But it's really, as far as we know, it's that black cutting edge to the yeah. bill. So obviously the, the Wanderer complex doesn't have a cutting edge except for Amsterdam, yep. whereas the Royals do have that cutting edge. And yeah. you can eliminate Royals when you're looking at something like this. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. All right, and then we come to um, the last species we're going to talk about tonight, which is if the Amsterdam was a holy grail, I'm not quite sure how you'd describe this. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's anybody, um, well, certainly not in the sub-region, that has seen this, this species, um, because there is only one record. Um, so Dom reckons when he put this slide together, the best time to see it would have been standing next to Peter Harrison in April 1983 yeah. on, on the observer vessel that he was on. And why it's so remarkable is this is one of the, there are far fewer northern hemisphere albatrosses than there are southern yep. Hemisphere albatrosses, and and this bird is is strictly speaking um, a Pacific bird, um, and it was it was seen um, sort of uh, south of Cape Agulhas. Yeah. Um, so this is this is a great little um, thanks to Trevor for for sending it to me. I was, I was struggling to to find it, but this is the write up from Peter Harrison. He's he's one of the top seabird experts in the world, if not the top seabird expert, and uh, he wrote this wonderful journal. I'm not going to read it all word for word, but he describes how he, I think, nearly fell off the, the ship when yeah. he saw this bird because he knew the significance and he even managed to photograph it. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about it earlier. This is probably perhaps one of those birds which in our lifetime might never be recorded in the subregion again, yeah. possibly along with, you know, the Asian Dowager. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to battle to get this one in our subregion. Sure. So we, we included it for completeness sake. Because we have 16 albatrosses recorded in Southern Africa, and yep. we hope that number grows. But it's not likely; we're not likely to see another one of these any, anytime soon. Yeah, but who knows? Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll probably more likely get a Campbell albatross or something <laughs> yes. like that. All right, so that um, kind of brings us to um, the end of all the species. Here's just some slides of of Laysan. It's obviously got that very dark cheek, um, and separating it from from the black black browed albatross, I think is probably the most likely confusion species. Yeah. Um, but as I say, if you, if you can't pick this out, um, the guide next to you will be having a heart attack when, when the one does float past um, the boat. All right, and then um, we're going we're gonna to go back to the mystery bird. Dave, are you, are you still there? Um, because we, we're almost right at the end and we want to know if you've got any winners there. I don't know if anyone's got all the species correct. Mark, I'm still here. We've had a great response. Lots of answers flying through. A couple of, some people have submitted three or four answers. As in, as in three or four attempts at it, as, as the uh, presentation has progressed. Are you going to run through the answers first and then I can announce the winner or? Yes, how, I'll, how would you like I'll, to do do the, I'll do the species first. So um, the first thing we have is a, is a wanderer. Um, so we've spoken about that and you can see this bird doesn't have the, the cutting edge, um, which, which allows us to identify it as a, as a wanderer. Um, I think that's probably the most key feature in, that, in this particular Yeah, image. and I mean, also that's, Quite chunky head, it's yeah. really strong square head, and that's really stout, robust bill, um, 
royals would probably have a more delicate looking bill and head. Right, and then we have a, a white chin petrel in the in the slightly in the distance, um, which is one of the most common seabirds you'd encounter on a pelagic trip, and we'll deal with um, petrels in a different webinar. Um, here's a pintado, one of the most recognisable pelagic species. Yeah, that upper wing is yeah, not going to mistake it as much. Absolutely distinctive, the, the chessboard um, upper wing, and also one of our most attractive um, petrels. Uh, then we, we have a second white chin petrel, so um, that was the duplicate bird. Yeah. Um, and then we have the obvious Shire albatross in the foreground. Um, and the, the final bird is probably the one that caused the most difficulty. Um, it looks superficially a bit like a Cory's shearwater, but it's actually a very cool gray petrel. Yeah, and I think it's the different depth of field here, which might throw a few people off. Um, so I mean, gray petrel and, and white chin petrel are pretty much the same size. Um, Shy albatross is quite a lot smaller than a wanderer, yeah. but it doesn't really show in this image. So I can understand if there are a lot of the... Uh, yeah, the, the pintado looks bigger than the white chin, which is uh, yeah. quite something because it's about half the size. Yeah. Um, all right, Dave, so that's, that's the answer to our quiz. Um, I don't know if you've got a winner. Yeah, okay, Mike, so there were, there were two correct answers, and um, so it came down to a photo finish. I had to, I had to check um, my WhatsApp time timestamp just to be sure that I got the, the first submission as the winner. Uh, so the runner-up was Adrian Hagner. He came second. Uh, it was very, very close, probably like literally 90 seconds apart. And the winner is uh, Trevor Hardacre. Oh, was, Trevor! <laughs> Damn it! Was so, well, so, so, so quick off the mark. Before, I mean, literally, you hadn't even sort of uh, moved on to the next slide, and he, he had the answers through. So, um, you know, Trevor you know, I'm actually. Um, Tre Trevor told me earlier today that he was going to be listening to the president speak instead of listening to our webinar, <laughs> and I said, "Well, there's a prize up for grabs, and you can see where his mind goes." So, um, well done, Trevor. That's yeah, awesome. Well done, Trevor. Um, I guess it's a, a, a fitting prize to a fitting winner because uh, nobody. Um, well, I don't think there's many people who've done more pelagic trips than you have. So, no. so congrats. That's awesome. Um, and then um, maybe just to, um, to do a very quick thank you to BirdLife South Africa. They are always huge supporters of us. They're running their own amazing series of, of uh, webinars called Conservation Conversations. And um, we don't see them as competitors. We see them as being very much complementary to what we do. They're very different in nature. And we'll continue to be running them side by side. And um, we'll continue to do these well after lockdown. Um, and um, yeah, and, and a final thanks to, to you, Dom, for taking time out on a, on a cold Wednesday night and, and joining us. Yeah, sure, no problem. Thanks for having me. And I believe in the next few weeks we'll be doing Correct. Carry On with the Seabird series and looking at, having a look at petrels and shearwaters and storm petrels. Yeah, so what we've decided to do is to do a, a series of, of probably three webinars dealing with all the tube noses. So we're not yep. going to touch on on penguins and gulls and terns um, and, and boobies, not quite at this stage. Yeah. We're going to be dealing with um, probably the, the petrels in, in the next webinar and in, in a, a webinar after that we'll do the storm petrels and, and the primes. Yeah. Um, so, so that's something to look forward to. We'll give all the details. Um, it just depends on when we get the time to put it all together. So, Tom, okay. thank you very much. It's been sure. awesome having you. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Um, keep safe and, and stay well and keep warm.